So Robin, uh, welcome to the Essential Implementation Podcast. Would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, what, what do you do? Um... Okay, um, I'm Robin Clay Williams. I'm a Professor of Human Factors at the Australian Institute of Health Innovation at Macquarie University in Australia. And I work in health systems to try and design those systems so that they're both safer for patients, but easier for patients to, to use. And that way the patient gets a better experience. So most of the work that we're doing at the moment is in uh, hospital emergency departments. Uh, the emergency departments in Australia, um, probably like other places in the world, like the UK, are really suffering at the moment. They're having increased uh, demand on them um, as people age and they become less unwell. Uh, in Australia, we've got a general practice system that um, has pretty much stopped bulk billing. We used to have a system where it was free to visit your general practitioner. Um, now, because the government hasn't increased the payment to general practitioners, there's a copay where the patient has to pay money to visit the GP. And what we're finding is that people can't afford that because the cost of living is going up. So, um, you know, you, you think, well, they would go to an emergency department because that's free, but what is actually happening is they're not going anywhere. So they're just sitting at home and they're getting sicker and sicker. And then when they come to the emergency department, they're actually quite sick. So our, our emergency departments are being overwhelmed and they're not well designed for the influx of patients that they're getting. So the work we're doing is with emergency departments, um, particularly with uh, vulnerable patients in emergency departments. So we're working with people, so with disability or with mental health conditions or culturally and linguistically diverse communities who don't do as well in the emergency department to try and redesign the systems so that they work better for those people. Wow. So because a lot of studies might say, uh, look, at, focus on the patient to maybe try and change the behavior of the patient or they might mm. work with the staff and try and get them to do something different. But is it, it, it it's fair to say your approach is slightly different in that you're trying to change the system? Yeah, um, we health, health services have been trying to change behaviour from the get-go. I think, unfortunately, a lot of implementation science really uh, concentrates on behaviour change and trying to get people to, you know, putting an intervention in place and then trying to change behaviour either through training or some other method so that people can then um, adapt to that intervention and use the new system. Um, yeah, human factors is not like that. So, so human factors in healthcare um, has a bit of a bad rap in a way. A lot of people think that human factors is about the soft skills or the non-technical skills. Um, so things like communication, teamwork and things like that. And they think that if you want to improve those skills, the way you do it is you train people and you change their behaviour. So they communicate better and they work better in teams. Um, in reality, the field of human factors is not about that. It's about system design. So if you design a system so that it's easy to use and so that it's designed for the purpose that it's meant to, the purpose that you want to use it for, people won't have to change behaviour. They'll just be able to use it. So so the way we approach things is it's really sort of 80% system design and then and then you might need to do a little bit of behaviour change at the end just to adapt. But, but really, if you design a good system, you're not going to have to do lots and lots of training and behaviour change to get people to use it. Uh and you mentioned about sort of um, touched on the equity kind of point there about trying to help those more disadvantaged communities. And do you think designing a system or changing a system is, is, is also a more effective approach than perhaps trying to change the behaviour of, again, of those individuals? Very much so. Um, I think as well, um, when we're talking about equity within a system, we're talking about designing a system that works for a large range of people or a variety of people and a variety of needs that people bring to that system. And um, often, you know, in system design or in system interventions, um, they're looking to try and constrain the system and to make it more narrow. And by doing that, you're not allowing for the diversity that you're going to get in the people that come into that system. So, so when we're looking at design, particularly for health systems, we really need to look at variability and we need to design systems that can cope with variability. Um, it's not just um, it's not just in the equity too, like being able to cope with different variety of patients. It's also even within an individual. Um, there's much more variation within the way an individual will present with a particular illness than you might get in sort of a technical type system where things are going to present exactly the same way each time. So by trying to constrain systems, um, we actually really prevent them from being flexible enough or adaptable enough to be able to help people um, where variation is involved.
Now that that's a yeah, I I totally get that because so it's kind of mm -hmm. like I, so whoever's kind of maybe got control or at least some control over the system might try and make it quite rigid. Um, so for an ex example, are we saying something like say guidelines for a doctor? Um, I I think yeah. I read somewhere you know that there might be two uh, doctors on on a ward overnight and they they see you know fifty patients come in. And if they'd actually followed the guidelines because of the, all the multi comorbidities and all the complications, they'd have to have read hundreds of pages of a hundred different guidelines just to follow exactly. And I, I was, what you're saying is in reality, there needs to be space to breathe in these systems, a bit of space for maybe creativity and, and adaptation. Is that kind of yeah. what you're saying? Yeah, definitely. Um, we did an audit in one of our D our EDs and there were over 800 guidelines that were meant to be followed. And and when you get so many of them, they're often in conflict with each other as well um, because no one actually, when they design the new one, they'll often implement it without integrating it with what's already there. So sometimes you, you find that, you know, you've got all these guidelines, they're in conflict. So which one are you meant to use? And what happens is people end up just not using any of them. Um, and then when something goes wrong, then, then management or an investigator will come in and go, well, which guideline were you supposed to use? And they will cherry pick the one that, you know, obviously was applicable where something went wrong and then the person gets blamed, you know, because they didn't follow the guidelines. So, yeah, in, in reality, I think, um, you know, a lot of a lot of it's to do with efficiency, a lot of the issues. So, mm -hmm. so we're trying to make our systems more efficient and when you try and make an, a system efficient, you try and lean it out. So I don't know if you've run across the lean manufacturing or whatever. So you try and take all the all the waste out of a system and you try and take the variation out of a system. And if you do that, it becomes really, really efficient, but it becomes completely inflexible. So, so because what you're doing is you're removing the slack from the system because in a normal, um, you know, if you look at the normal patient on a normal day, um, slack just looks like waste you know, but it, but if you think about having to deal with a variety of unexpected events or unexpected conditions, you need that slack to, to allow you to adapt. So, so efficient systems look really good until something goes wrong or something unexpected comes up and then they, then they just fail, they're inefficient and something goes wrong. So, yeah, so the drive for inefficiency is, is part of the problem. And by eliminating that slack or variability, you're also eliminating the ability of the system to be equitable for people who aren't that norm. You know, it's really just geared for the norm. And if you're not the norm, you, you know, you're not going to get as good a deal really. We're not building cars here, are we? We're, no. we're, these are health, <laughs> these are people and health systems and a lot more complex than say building a car. It's not a step-by-step -step process. Um, no. And the, yeah. yeah and that's one of the, that's one. Of, no, I was just <laughs> going to say that's one of the problems is that a lot of healthcare has sort of, um, put their process improvement processes. They've they've adopted them from industries like the manufacturing industry. Um, they've adopted some of them from places like aviation, and I, I can talk about that because I come from aviation, which will probably put fear in the heart of most healthcare people because <laughs> aviation has done so much damage to healthcare. Really, um, you know, Whoa. taking processes from a really structured industry like aviation or manufacturing and applying them to an industry where there is necessary variation in being able to provide good quality care to patients. You, you're really doing the service a disharm by trying to make it rigid like that. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, 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 I experienced a sort of classic example of this uh, in in a in a meeting not so long ago, where um, I think that I think there's two things we might just go over briefly. One is de-implementing things, um, yes. trying to create slack, and the other is perhaps psychological safety and trust and um, trying to make it safe to, to, to maybe fail forward. I heard someone say the other day. So um, yeah, the, 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 there was a team that um, successfully managed to remove double checking with nurses, which saved sort of six minutes of their time. But the funders of this work then asked the question, what are you going to replace it with? So there is no acknowledgement of, oh, maybe just allow that slack. You know, maybe just allow yeah. it. Uh, it, it. That's interesting. So, yeah, what, what's your view about de-implementation yeah. and, and, and safety for people to make mistakes? Um, so de-implementation is really important. Uh, the more you can simplify the system. So the more things you take out of the system, the more you're simplifying that system, the, the more simpler system will be safer in the presence of change or dy dynamic 
situations. So, so the more the more um, the more you add to the system, the more complex it is. The more likely it's it's going to fail, and the more likely it's going to fail in an unexpected way. So, by by de-implementing and making your system uh, simpler, you're actually making it safer, and you're making it more resilient to to any unexpected event. Um, and we know that theoretically, um, but it's very difficult to get people to accept it uh, in the real world um, because people think that um, people are still of the of the um, way of understanding safety and the way we used to understand it in probably the 90s and early 2000s where this was uh, this idea of a cascade of errors you know so that so they're almost like a swiss cheese you know with holes in the different layers and you get a cascade of errors through the holes and look there you would get your event at the other end and the way to stop that is you put barriers into the different levels to stop that cascade um, now we know that's not really how systems work. Uh, systems don't fail in a linear way like that. Um, systems fail in unexpected and complex ways. And the more barriers that you put in the system, uh, the more complex it is and the more likely it is to fail in an unexpected way. Um, so I could give you an example from aviation just to because it's, it's a very simple one and easy to understand. So uh, the German wings accident that happened uh, back in the, I don't know how long ago it was, a decade and a half ago, um, where where the pilot uh, suicided and and managed to lock um, everybody out of the cockpit um, and they couldn't get in to stop to stop this person doing that and the reason was was because that locking of the cockpit was a barrier that was put in place as a result of 9/11 to stop a terrorist getting into the cockpit. So, so you know, a, a person who thinks in a linear way would think, okay, we don't want terrorists to get in this cockpit, we'll make it lockable and you can't get in without the pilot actually physically unlocking it and letting you in. A complex system, well, sure, it won't let the terrorists into the cockpit, but it also won't let the flight stewards in there to stop the pilot if they're doing something. So, so it, you know, that, and you get the same thing happening in healthcare where you get lots and lots of layers in to stop things that, retrospectively have happened in the past and yeah it might stop that retrospective thing from ever happening again but there's all these other inadvertent consequences of other things then happening yeah and i i i had some uh, doctors on the podcast um a while back and they were saying how there's a lot of paperwork and a lot of different bits of paper and it was this question about is a risk averse culture actually worthwhile overall if you stop that one in 1000 from having i don't know a fall but the, yep. the the cost on the system is that there's no time for anything um is it worth it um so yeah yeah i mean the other thing it's doing is it's really affecting the quality of care i mean one of the key tenets of healthcare is that health professionals are providing care to to a patient or a, or a consumer and you know, once they get so busy that all they can do is processes and they don't have time, they're not able to actually provide that one-on-one -on -one caring provision of care that that's really the tenet of what healthcare is all about. So it completely breaks that whole, you know, doctor-patient or nurse-patient relationship. I mean, we're finding in EDs at the moment that um, the nurses are so busy that they end up very process-oriented. So, so um, within a complex system, so a very, very busy, complex system, you're much better to use goal-oriented processes. So where you say, okay, the goal is to do this. So in this case, perhaps care for the patient. And how you do that, you're able to flex depending on the situation you find yourself in and the needs of that patient to provide the best care that you're able for that patient. Um, a process-oriented system is more like what we're seeing in healthcare with all the guidelines that says, well, we're not going to worry about the goal. We're going to assume that, you know, we've decided on the goal. This is how you get there. And you have to follow these individual steps. And you see it in things like checklists. You see it in things like guidelines where there's no flexibility. You just have to follow the list of steps. So when people start following steps, <laughs> they lose sight of the big picture and they lose sight of that whole care interaction. And we're finding in EDs that... Um, they're just following processes. And a lot of the processes are around the IT systems and the information systems. So they're spending more time on the computer, you know, like ticking boxes and making sure that all these things have been complied with and very little time actually providing that holistic patient care. And it's not just affecting the patient, it's also affecting the healthcare professional. You know, they're getting burnt out. Mm -hmm. um, they're not having joy in work. 
Um, they're worried about, you know, um, why did I get into this? You know, it's not providing the sorts of, you know, value that I, the things that I value in my life. You know, I want, I got into this because I care for people and that's what I want to do. And I was spending all my time on a computer. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I, um, did some work uh, around frailty a few years ago and um, I had the pleasure of speaking to uh, patients who, who'd who been taken into um, hospital you know for maybe they'd had a fall and broken a hip and there was a well, I remember one lady she was she'd been a nurse for 40 years in the in the serve in the in the trusts in England NHS and she was saying how yeah that she was saying exactly what you just said that that sort of human aspect of the care had, had sort of gone um, and she was she was in 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 her bed in, on the ward, and she needed help, someone to help her kind of sit up. And this young uh, health assistant said, "Oh, I'm I'm not allowed to touch patients. You know, I'm just here to kind of uh, watch people." And and it, she was like, "This is what's happened because I think yeah. we we often uh, refer to these things as kind of soft things, don't we? That they're not they're very hard to measure, and they don't really matter as much as the main sort of process." But actually, I, I know from my own experience, if I go and see a doctor and they give me an extra five, 10 minutes longer than maybe normal and they actually really connect. I think I think there's actually evidence, isn't there, that you you tend to do better in terms of getting well. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and it is what patients value. Like if, if you ask the patient, what do you want out of your health care? Mm. They want that care. They want that care interaction. Like if you if you look at, you know, we do a lot of patient experience surveys or we work with patient experience surveys and we interview patients about, you know, their needs and preferences for care. And it's all about that care interaction. And so much so that you even find, you know, if there's a medical error of some sort, the person, the patient is actually quite understanding if the, if the care was provided in a personable, caring way. You know, they're much more understanding than if the person just followed the process and they were impersonal. Uh, the patient will just want to sue, you know. But if there was that care element, yes. um, you know, there's much more understanding of, oh, well, they were just human, you know, everybody makes a mistake, you know, quite a different approach, you know. And when when you look at care, I, I, I feel like we're sort of starting to understand the importance of the, of the they're talking about it in, t in a phrase called co-production at the moment, but they're starting to look at the importance of both the, the consumer and the clinician co-providing the care so that it's a relationship between the two of them that provides that care rather than this sort of mechanised you know, clinician comes in with all this stuff and, and just does care on the patient as opposed to with the patient. Wow. Um, so I suppose I'd be really ke keen to know what, I mean, I know it's probably difficult because every bit of work you do will be different, but what's your sort of process then when you, are tasked with uh, working with a system. What's your process? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Cool. So, so first of all, we need to really understand the system because every every single, you know, they say if you've seen one emergency department, you've seen one emergency department. They're all different. <laughs> every hospital's different. They're all unique. So, so the first thing we need to do is we need to understand the system that we're working with. And the way we do it is um, we do, we do modelling. We use some human factors tools, so things like a tool called cognitive work analysis. We use things like functional resonance analysis methods. So they're just big terms for different modelling methods to try and help understand how a complex system functions. Um, so we go in and we do observations. We'll, we'll often start with a document review and see, well, how's the system meant to function, you know, if it functions the way you know, the, uh, the healthcare organisations think it's meant to function. And then we'll go in and do observations and go, well, yeah, how does it really function? We'll talk to the clinicians who work there and also some of the other people who work there. Like you'd be amazed how much you can learn from, you know, the people who do the cleaning or the wards people that move the patients around. Um, so we, we interview people and then we, uh, and then we talk to the patients. So we do, um, we interview the different types of patients or cohorts of patients that would access that service. Um, and then we analyze all that data and we say, okay, well, what have we got here? We've got a system that looks like it behaves in this particular way. Um, these are the sticking points of the system. So for example, uh, one of the projects we're doing in an emergency department to do with culture and linguistically diverse um, patients, we're finding that the really big issue is communication. 
So when we when we've analysed all the data, you know, fifty interviews and you know, one hundred and sixty hours of observations and things like that, um, there's many things. But one of the key things is this communication, and it's not just um, you know getting an interpreter or being able to communicate in their language. It, it's to do with an understanding of how the health system works. So. So people often think that um, people who don't have English first language just don't really understand, you know, the English terminology and things. But but often if they come from another country, they don't have good health system literacy. So they don't understand how the system's meant to work. So when they come into the system, they have certain expectations. And the people who work in the system don't have time to talk to them about how the system works. So they just do their work and there's this big clash you know, and it, it's it, it really causes problems. Um, to to give you an example um, of something to do with communication, um, so we had so we had a patient that we were talking to who had a, a blood pressure problem, and she came in with this screaming headache, and they measured her blood pressure in triage, and it was very very high, it was up around two hundred over oh. something or other. So so anyway, so they looked at her like, what blood pressure medication are you taking? And she said she'd been to her general practitioner recently, about a week and a bit ago, and he'd given her a new medication and he'd said, um, okay, so here's another medication for you. And she thought that he meant that that medication replaced her previous medication. So she stopped taking the previous one. And in reality, it was a medication for something different. Hmm. So she'd stopped her blood pressure medication a week and a half ago and lo and behold, her blood pressure was through the roof. And there she was in an emergency department. So, so it's more than just understanding English. It's sort of understanding how healthcare works and things like that. So, I think I've gone completely off the system, off the topic. Now, I was to- talking about how we do things, wasn't I? Okay. Yeah, so yeah. when, uh, so once we got all this data, uh, we have a look and we say, okay, well, what are the potential things that could be done in the system? And then we co-design. So we get consumers and clinicians in a room. And we sit them down for a couple of hours and we talk about, okay, this is the problem. These are, these are the constraints that we've got to work with. Let's solve the problem together. And then you, you work with the consumers and clinicians. And if you've got them both in the room together, it's quite good. They can sort of see each other's viewpoint. Uh, the clinicians can make sure that things are medically safe that happen. And the consumers can make sure that things meet their needs. Uh, the new thing we're about to try, we haven't done it yet, but we're about to get the executives into the co-design because they're the ones who are going to pay for the implementation change. And we think that if we get them involved in co-design, we can get them on board right from the get-go and they can be there in the same room as the consumer saying, well, we can't afford to do that, you know, and, and actually see like what the implications are of their decision on that consumer. So that's our next step. I love that step. Um I, I think that's brilliant because I, I, I mean, I've had, I've had, um, I think Laura Damstrader and Alison Metz were on the podcast oh, yeah. and uh, that, that was a great one. And they were saying how um, it's often, uh, even if you've got patients on board and, and you've got clinician on board, and even if it's, it, it's an improvement over what was there before, you know, the out, outer setting factors like financing or like exec, the executive decisions can sort of just completely end it there and then. Yeah. So I think that's genius yeah. to get them all in one room. I think that's brilliant. Yeah, and they're keen. They're keen. I mean, they haven't done it yet. They might change their mind when they've done it, but they're keen right now. I mean, the other thing we do is we run a health economics analysis in parallel with what we're doing. Yeah. So that when we come up with, you know, potential interventions, we run a business case on them through the health economists, and you can then present that business case to to the executive team. So that helps as well. Um <sighs> doesn't necessarily solve the problem but at least you know you've got you've got um your solution in the language that the executives are used to hearing so when they're deciding on something you know they've yeah. got that information to help yeah i my, my feelings has been for a while that it's um in this in, in these systems systems there are all these different stakeholders and actually they, they need to be talking more and getting to, to empathize yeah. with each other more and so do you think that's a big part of what you what you're probably going to be doing is yeah. yeah, I think I think so. Um, so so you find for a lot of a lot of these sorts of interventions that we do in health systems that that it doesn't matter what the intervention is, the value is usually in getting people talking. Oh, right. So so right. So we found. Um, I mean, one of the very very first things I did when I came across to healthcare was run some team skills training, and um, I don't. The value what came out of it was that the value wasn't actually in the team skills training the value was in training people from different areas at the same time 
in the same room. And it was the conversations that they had around the training rather than the training itself that I think made the difference. So, yeah, yeah. so it's the case with anything. If you can get people talking and, and people are natural, um, are natural at solving problems. So a lot of people in the system already know or they already have ideas about the solution. They just need a platform to be out and some support to be able to put those into place. Yeah, I, I think um, there's... Uh, a bit of work being done about re relationship building and how it, whether it's in research or an implementation process um it's that relationship building and having effective experiences together and uh, hearing other people's views that that really it might be more important than your implementation strategy you know it might be what yeah. so yeah i can i totally get that and i think it's 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 really not on people's radar i mean i I was in a meeting yesterday, um, quite a senior meeting, and I, I thought, nobody here, we've been talking for a, over a few years, you know, once every few months, nobody here really knows what anyone else's values are, or why they do this work, or, you know, and it, 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 it doesn't feel safe, those meetings, it feels like, what if I say something stupid, like, what are they gonna, you know, it, that's what they're like, and I think yeah. that this is really hindering progress, you know. So, um, yeah, very, very much so. I mean, I think, conversations on what do we value is a really important starting point. I mean, it's quite an important um, point for your team. So, so in my research team, for example, uh, one of my key things when I'm looking for new people to join the team, like what sorts of things am I looking for? I'm looking for people who have common values with what we have. So, so my, I mean, in academia, you get all sorts of different values and, and aims that people want. So so my team is people who who want to make a difference. You might say we're all naive, but they're, they're all people that want to make a difference in the health system. And because we all have that same value in common, we're, we're, it, it helps us align, you know, and helps smooth out some of the other differences among the team. And you can have a team that's very diverse, which is great because the more diverse the team is, this is another theoretical thing that works in practice, the more diverse the team is, the, the more effective you're going to be because you'll have a greater variety of ideas, you'll be able to, um, you know, explore broader concepts and things like that. Um, but you do need something that sort of aligns everybody so you can all work together and for me that's having similar values um of what you're trying to achieve or what you value in the health system yes um so mm -hmm. let's say you you you've had a uh, you've got the execs the patients the clinicians all together or, or consumers is that that sounds like the phrase in in your neck of the, the world uh, oh yeah we, uh, <laughs> yeah we do use consumers i i used it in uh, norway i was at a conference in norway and i used consumers <laughs> and they were all really insulted they thought that was really rude um it's 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 sort of the politically correct term in australia for patients um we call yeah. them consumers um we don't treat them like consumers though um sure. we treat them they don't have the same rights that consumers have by any stretch. I, I wonder if maybe they call them consumers because they feel better the, better about maybe they've got more rights if we call them that. Yeah. But I'm not sure they do have. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. let's say that, that you've got them all in the room. You've you've identified uh, some some issues in the system. Um, would you would you then get sort of rely on things like uh, improvement practices to correct those, or maybe some frameworks you might use. Yeah. A framework or two or, yes. or what, what's the what happens then I mean, yeah. yeah yeah so no so you do you do so what once you've decided what you what you're going to do or or you know usually a prioritized list of what you'd like to do because you can never do everything um and what we do is we put that through our model so um at the moment with our emergency departments we've got a cognitive work analysis model called the work domain analysis which is it's a model of our emergency departments uh, without the people in it. So it's all the constraints of the emergency department. And what it does is it allows you to look at a potential intervention to put it into this model and it will show you what the conflicts are. So it will show you what the resource implications are. Um, so, for example, often people put interventions into place and don't think about what's already there and they don't think about other interventions that are happening in parallel. So... One of the characteristics of healthcare in Australia is there's just multiple interventions happening all the time, completely uncontrolled and often, you know, just done by individuals that don't even know about the other event intervention happening. So what this tool does is it lets you look at your intervention, lets you look at the other interventions that you're aware of, and you can see the implications. So 
you know, are you going to be sucking resources from someone else to do your thing? Um, you know, do you need additional resources? Um, are there implications for safety? Are there implications for um, the staffing? Are there implications for, you know, the space for the space design, for example, of your emergency department? So it allows us to sort of flag all those things. And then we can look at that and decide, okay, so which ones look like they're more doable um, within the current constraints because nobody has a lot of money for new things. Um, and it also allows us to actually contact or modify people that are do doing other interventions to make sure that we're aligned with what they're doing. Once we've done that, <laughs> we then we will choose it. We will choose an intervention and we'll pilot it. So, we, so we'll put it into place, we'll pilot it over a short time. We do it in conjunction with the clinicians because they're the ones who obviously have to enact it. Um, and we evaluate it. So you, we collect, collect, <laughs> so this is a bit of a long, a long thing, but we collect both performance data. So the traditional data one will collect yeah. in a health system, but we also collect uh, experience data, both staff experience and patient experience data associated with that. And we do a pre-post so you can see if there's change over time. Wow. Um, that's, that. yeah, that's a very short way of doing it. <laughs> I bet that's that. it. <laughs> It, I mean, just for people listening, because it sounds quite technical, but extremely useful. Is there, especially when you put it into a, a model, a software type model, uh, is there any way we, people can learn that, you know, learn something like that and try it themselves? Yeah, so we're, yeah. Yeah, we're trying to, we're working at the moment with, um, to release the model open source so that other EDs across the world can use it. So um, I think it's going to, I think it's going to be another six to 12 months before we can do it because we need to make sure that it's, we've got it validated for our particular emergency departments, but we want to try and validate it a bit more widely and just make sure it's generalizable. But we're trying, as I said, we're trying to make it open source so people could have a look at it. Um, we'll have some tools in there about how you might use it. And then the, they could trial their own ED interventions. Um, I've got some people in my team that want to do models of the whole hospital and, wow. <laughs> so, and then the world. But, the, the problem with a lot of this stuff, though, is it's expensive. I mean, we're, we're funded by large government grants. Um, it's very difficult for health systems to have the resources available to do this type of stuff. So, yeah, it's it's interesting because it, I, I think it does provide value over time. So if you looked at a five-year time horizon or a 10-year time horizon, there's a lot of value in it, but, but few health organisations can, you know, put a couple of million dollars to forward load one of these sort of developments. Yeah, yeah, I, I think a lot of us who work in this area are kind of a bit, uh, getting a bit tired of seeing uh, funding come in, studies take place, the usual type of studies. We're going to change this behavior mm -hmm. or we're going to list, the, you know, work out the barriers and facilitators. And we're not really seeing any significant change. In fact, no. um, a lot of these systems are kind of collapsing a little bit, if I'm going to be honest, not doing that great. A lot of the staff are leaving. That's a clue that it's not well designed. So uh, a well a well designed a well designed intervention should be sustainable once you remove all the all those initial resources we have when we first put something in. So so often, you know, when an intervention comes in, there's all this support and resources around it and it looks really great. And then, you know, once it's working, people go, Well, it's working now, and they just pull the resources and it gradually fails. If it's well designed, it should be self-sustaining. Um, or at least sustainable with only a small amount of resource input to it. Yeah. Do you think sort of systems a systems approach then is has the potential to increase how much impact we're having? Yeah, I think it does. I I think um, I it's it goes way way beyond that too though. Like I think <laughs> um you know I think we need to go step back a little. And think about, you know, what do we want from our healthcare system? What do we value? What are we looking for? And then go, okay, so to get there, if this is the ideal that we're looking for, how do we get from here to there? Rather than this is the problem right in front of my face, I need to solve that quick, put an intervention into place to solve it. Um, because all we're doing is like Band-Aid solutions all the way along and, and we end up 10 years or 15 years down track and look back and find that really nothing much has changed, you know, and we've spent all this money and all this time and, you know, it, it's no better than it was 10 years ago. And in safety, in safety terms, um, 
it hasn't improved over two decades. There's still one in ten people harmed that go that visit a health professional. Oh my word! Yeah, I... so so it's not so it's not working. It's not working. But you know, it it, it really does need a, a step back and a look at it more at a systems level, and and certainly an agreement about what we value because you you, you measure and you you work on what you value. So if you value efficiency. Um, then you are going to measure, you're going to take efficiency measures and you're going to be leaning out your system and you're going to be reducing all your slack. If you value care, you might look at it differently. You might do different things or make different decisions. So, it, you know, I think we need to go back and have some conversations about that because I, I feel that for a lot of people, um, healthcare just is not meeting their needs anymore. Um, not just that, not just their needs, you know, am I going to get seriously ill and die, but just their day to day needs like, and their interaction with the system. Yeah. That is huge because I'm thinking it's, uh, yeah, the conversation is really going to go as it's a cultural conversation. It's a culture about our politics, probably it's, um, mm. cause I imagine for the, I mean, for the politicians often it's, I need to be, if there's an emergency, I need to be seen like we can get rid of the emergency. Uh, we need to be within budget. It's the same for exec managers. It needs to bottom line is probably the most important thing. Efficiency, be, seeing people within the four hour window. I think we spoke about that before. Um, yeah. So that's that's the kind of thing, isn't it? But then the patients, what they yeah. want is very different. Clinicians, very different. And there seems to be a big disconnect. And it's not working, is it? You're, yeah. you're right. That, that... <laughs> no, I, yeah. I don't. I don't think it is. I mean, at the moment, we measure what's easy to measure. You know, numbers are nice and easy. We can yes. measure is someone does someone is someone seen in the emergency department and either admitted to the hospital or sent home within four hours. You know, we can measure that. We can, you know, clock what time they go in. We clock what time they go out. So, so and and people who are in you know executive positions or in government. You know, they like numbers. They can hold numbers up. They can graph them. They can show change. Has it got better or has it got worse? And, you know, you know, so, so you know, that's how it works. But we, yeah. we're not really thinking about the big picture. So say in the emergency department, for example, we know from studies that we've done that there's an inverse relationship between the time it takes to get through the ED and safety, patient safety in that ED. So say, for example, um, if you if you think of safety measures on a, on a, on a continuum from say zero at one end and four at the other end. Okay. So if, if you change your safety assessment, so you, you can, you can measure this through accreditation or, you know, just audits and things like that. If, if you change it by one point um, across that spectrum, um, it makes a difference. And I just wrote the numbers down here so that I would get it right. It makes a difference of wait time of um, five minutes per patient and a difference of length of stay of 18 minutes per patient. So, so if you change, improve the safety by one point, that's an extra five minutes per patient waiting time, an extra 18 minutes per patient time length of stay. Now, EDs are measuring time. So, so they, they're trying to reduce that. So, so by reducing that, they're reducing the safety of that particular system. But wow. they don't measure the safety. So they don't know. And they don't care because they don't measure that. Right. Yes. They, they care about right. what they measure, what they're held accountable to. And, yeah. You know. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. So, so, and I, I mean, I get it, but I think we're measuring the wrong things. Yeah. You know, I think, I think if you, if you want, you, you need to measure what you value. Um, and if you value safety, then you shouldn't be measuring time. Um, you know, we measure time because it's easy. Yeah. This has really been, uh, yeah, really highlighted uh, and lit up. <laughs> the whole thing around systems mm. because it, you're hearing it bandied around a lot now. Um, uh, people talking about uh, complexity science a little bit. Well, I could, I could t talk a little bit about complexity. So, yeah. so um, part of the thing in healthcare too, is that we've got lots, lots of tools. So, so people who are managing safety within a healthcare system, for example, or trying to solve problems within a healthcare system, they've got lots of tools available to them to sort of measure and make change. Um, and, but the tools only work in certain characteristics of systems. So, so if you think of a system in terms of how complex is it and you think of a system in terms of how predictable is it. So, for example, a mechanical system, it could be quite complicated, but it's not very complex and it's quite predictable. So a mechanical system, you know, every time you turn it on, 
hopefully it's going to work exactly the same way. Whereas a people with whereas a system with lots of people in it, particularly if you get lots of interactions between people, um, it becomes more complex and it's less predictable. Because uh, if you think of a person, you know, operating maybe on a bell curve each day, you know, they 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 vary in how they perform each day. And if you get lots of people interacting with different levels of performance, you can get quite unpredictable outcomes from that system. So in terms of that. Um, you need to use the tools for the right area. So if you're operating in a system that you can simplify it and that's quite predictable, you can use a lot of those tools from industrial industries. Yeah. So an example of an area of healthcare that's like that is maybe anaesthetics um, or control of blood products, for example. These are systems that are quite can be quite uh, simplified and well understood and and quite replicable so you can replicate them over and over at the same each time if you have a system like that you can use things like checklists you can use things like regulation and standardization and all those sort of uh tools that you use in mechanized industries and they're really effective but if you get a system that um is uncontrollably complex and unpredictable so think about the health system during covid for example um those tools don't apply anymore they just don't work in that type of system so you, you have to use different tools, you have to use different approaches, and rather than constraining people and trying to get them to follow a regimented the same process each time, you have to leverage the ability of people to adapt and to vary and to, to think outside the box. So it's quite a different way of operating. And I think sometimes in health, and it can change from minute to minute or place to place in healthcare. So I think, you know, it's important for clinicians or quality managers in healthcare to understand that about their system and to give people the flexibility to move from one way of operating to another, depending on the situation which they find themselves. And that probably, that is a, would require a fundamental shift in how we view risk, I suppose, do you think? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes, because, because you know, the, the quality manager or the safety manager will think that they're uh, reducing risk by, con by trying to operate in that constrained environment. And they're only reducing risk in that environment if the, if the context matches the tool they're using. If they're trying to use those types of risk management tools in an uncontrolled environment like COVID, they're actually increasing the risk of something going wrong, not reducing it. It's one of those barrier type things where they're just making it more complex. Yeah, I, I never forget that um, during COVID, infection control decided without talking to the staff that they were going to remove the seating in the staff room so you'd have a nurse with people you know masked up apron gloves sweating for six hours goes for her break they've taken the seat the chairing away to reduce the infection risk and i think right. that probably increased the risk overall right because they're going to be more tired and make more mistakes yeah. and the morale yeah. be low so uh, and that is a perfect example I was going to say just just the importance of um, approaching it from the viewpoint of the patient. You know, it's it's the patient that the care is meant to be about the patient, and it's the patient who experiences that care and values that care. So we really need to understand what the patient needs are, and to work from there outwards, rather than to work from what are the needs of the health system, and then we'll fit the patient into that. Yes, and and like you've you've said before be goal orientated so always remember about that about the, the, what the patient needs or wants uh, instead of process driven right um, yeah very much so yeah somebody gave me uh, I learned the term fidelity to function rather than fidelity to form I think that's Penelope or it's work I'm no doubt you know because she's from Australia as well yeah yeah I love that that I, I try to tell people I work with about that so yeah all right Robin it's been lovely lovely talking with you you too. Cheers. Bye. Bye.